start. So welcome everybody and welcome everybody online. So my name is Pierre Miege. I'm the director of the CFC, the French Research Center, and we have been hosting here at HKUST. Today we co-organize with the division of public policy this event with Patrick Le Galles, who is coming from Sciences Po Paris in France. And we will talk about the Brexit. And we're also very happy to have Professor Masaru Yahime, who will moderate this event. Uh, Professor Masaru Yahime is an associate professor here at the Division of Public Policy. And he works on the question of innovation technologies um, in the cities and the question of smart city and sustainability. So thank you very much for moderating. And thank you, Professor Le Gales. I will let the Professor Yahime present you. Okay. Have a good uh, event. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, very much for your kind of introduction. Um, so today we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Patrick Regales. Um, he is the um, CNRS research professor of politics, sociology, and urban studies at Sciences Po Paris Center for European Studies and Comparative Politics. He was the founding dean of Sciences Po Urban School and also the president of the uh, Society for Advanced Socioeconomics, the editor of the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research. And he's the current co-editor of the European Journal of Sociology. And also he's the K1 Distinguished Visiting Professor at Hong Kong Baptist University. And his work deals with comparative public policy, state restructuring, comparative urban governance of large metropolis, mobility, and urban class making and political economy. And his recent publications include Reconfiguring European Studies in Crisis. And also um, he co-edits the Handbook of Comparative Global Urban Studies with uh, Jenny Robinson to appear in June, 2023. And he's currently working on the book on the post-Brexit British state, which is a topic of today's seminar. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Lugares, and I the floor. Yes, you are. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction. I hope I'm to live up to it. It's a great pleasure to be uh, giving a talk to this uh, prestigious university and to the Centre d'Etudes Franco-Chinois, Pierre is uh, directing, so uh, I'm extremely honoured. What I want to present this morning is uh, ongoing work on the transformation of uh, the UK state. Um, you know, in political science these days, people are not interested anymore in some of the big questions, not enough. You have to turn to political economy people to think about the transformation of the state. So I'm part of a group of European scholars trying to think about what happens to states uh, with globalization and a number of crises to be dealt with. And for many years, I've been working on the UK, uh, which is a very strange place. You know, it's an island full of English, very strange place. Uh, but in many ways, has been the laboratory of a number of experiments about state destroying mechanism and state making mechanism that have been influenced Europe or have been the sort of things people didn't want to do. So basically, something happened once called Brexit. And the idea was to use that as an external shock to understand what sort of transformation of the state was going on in connection to leaving the EU. Um, and the subtitle may be something like searching for the state. That's what I'm saying here. And my argument is that, you know, the, the British elite believed at some point that they would do something called global Britain and the Brexit rhetoric had a lot of ideas about we'll join the Pacific Trade Agreement, we'll do a number of things, and we might become something like the Hong Kong of Europe or Singapore of Europe. And this experiment has so far failed, and they are still a bit a European country, and they are searching for something. So the idea of the talk today is precisely to underline some of those constraints going on. So look in progress, I am doing with my colleague, uh, with Tim. I can move forward here. Here we go. Um, and that's what's all about. Just to make sure I'm not an area specialist. So what I want to do is to think about the transformation of European states. And we've done a lot of work about that. Think about globalization crisis, EU, and thinking about states and public policy. So I'm part of these people 
using the public policy to understand the transformation of a state. In the state literature, classically, you look at states and then you think about public policy. Uh, I'm developing a research project called the policy state. We argue that uh, states in Europe <coughs> produce so many public policies, but in fact, it is the effect of the public policies that is the main driver to transform the state. But that's for another talk for another day. And, and the UK as, as a laboratory, of course, being the, the interesting uh, thing to look at. The second point beyond Brexit is to emphasize that historically, crises are important moment to uh, make change and to receive, again, state making mechanism and, and state destroying mechanism. But it's also an opportunity for some groups to try to change without changing, you know, the old Leopardo case in Italy. So to produce new sources of authority that they will control. So crises are also an opportunity for some groups to stay in power while changing a number of arrangements. And we see a lot of that in the UK today. So you remember that Brexit took place in 2016, the referendum, and officially started uh, at the end of January. And you just have the date uh, correct. So really the research questions is, uh, historically, the UK had become slowly, incrementally, not very visibly, a normal European state. I will explain what it means with the concept of a member state that my colleague from Cambridge, Bickerton, has explained very well. So the idea was one of the main transformation of a UK state for 30 years was the belonging to the EU. And you could see, I will summarize briefly, how the, the classic UK state was profoundly transformed by joining the EU. So the Brexit, of course, it's a great experiment to look at to what extent we see some transformation of the British state because they are leaving the EU and what sort of, again, state making, state destroying mechanism. What can we, we do with that? And of course, the logic is to try to link that to some of the transformation of the economy. The British economy is a particularly interesting political economy. It's the most open political economy in Europe. And historically, the, the development of the UK is always about attracting South, like Hong Kong, attracting talents and finance, um, and, and then trying to, to, to go all over the world. So uh, the project of, uh, of uh, Brexit was part of this, of this year. My argument will be to show a number of things. Number one, that the Brexit, you know, everywhere in Europe, we have seen uh, quite long-term logic dynamics of decentralization, including Wales and Scotland in the UK. Uh, Brexit has triggered a reversal. Britain is probably the most centralized country in Europe. And after Brexit, one of the reaction of state elite has been to re-centralize in all sorts of ways. Mm. Number one. Second, the Brexit is having a centrifugal effect, meaning we see a lot of uh, uh, economic forces, a lot of fragmentation developing within uh, the British state. Thirdly, I want to emphasize that one of the most important dynamics that was behind Brexit, but which is now having full play in the UK state and UK politics, is the revival of English nationalism, which is a term you didn't listen because the Brits are, they say, British, okay? Historically, you think about the nation state, which is not a nation state, and the, the creation of this British identity was a way to incorporate the Scots and the Welsh. Nobody cares about the Irish. Um, and, and this British dimension uh, is completely now in decline and contested by this English nationalism, which creates a different kind of state behind it and having consequences on the organization, the strange organization, and my colleagues Colin Hay has coined the word Brexistentialism, meaning that there's a risk that uh, Ireland will reunite at some point. I think that will take place in the next three decades, and nobody knows what will happen to Scotland. So there's a very risk of a, a particular kind of state might disintegrate. And I want to emphasize also that uh, with the COVID crisis and Ukraine, uh, the, the Brexit project and the economic, the Brexit project has not worked well at all for the UK. And there's a very recent understanding, both within the elite and within the general population, that uh, a project that was really epitomized by Liz Truss of trying to go towards a more neoliberal role in a market-oriented states uh, with low tax, low welfare state, um, and, and more connected to, to 
globalized uh, markets outside the EU is not working well. So you know, it's an interesting moment where nobody, everybody's lost. Okay, if you follow the UK debate, the elite are lost, the people are lost, most interest groups are lost. I love to read the Financial Times every morning because they are completely lost and they don't know what is good for the country. It's a bit like reading the South Morning Post and you see a lot of constraints about Hong Kong and China, you know, you see all these constraints. Financial Times is a bit like that. So there's a real interesting moment at, at, to, to discuss those things. In terms of method, I'll, I'll come back to that if you're interested. So I'll make four arguments to read too quickly. One is about wait, the transformation of European states and the British having this dimension, so we're part of the story. Second, uh, the revenge of central government in the UK. So how Brexit has triggered mechanism to transform the organization of a British state. Thirdly, I'll mention this rise of English nationalism and the demise of a British European state. It's an argument about the court of justice and the role of the justice system in the British institutions. And fourthly, I'll mention, uh, not very well developed, something about the, the British political economy and the argument being uh, about, do we see a state making markets or markets making states? And um, in the UK, we've seen recently that uh, the bad results, economically speaking, are triggering and raising some of the long-term economic problem of the UK, which are now uh, becoming very important. And to a large extent, the question to, for the British elite today is, do we need to revive some forms of intervention to deal with long-term uh, difficulty of the British economy, for instance, very low productivity, or do we, do we need to have more markets uh, in a neoliberal way, markets failure, we need more markets, uh, in order to revive the British economy? So we are exactly at this debate at the moment, and I will give you a provider, number of figures to develop this idea. So very briefly, the first part, it's coming from the work I've done with Desmond King uh, in, in Liffith College, Oxford, and we have long-term consequence. And we have worked with a number of European scholars about what happened to European states and emphasizing all the contradictions of the state. So we follow uh, Poggi, Gianfranco Poggi, the great Italian theorist, with the idea that we have a cycle of the state and it's not the same state that before, but it's still a very important state in Europe. And we need to characterize the transformation. Um, and one of the key points which I like in the, in the thinking of, of Poggi, who is a sort of neo weberian is he had a lovely phrase about the end of a unifying energy of the state. So maybe some good things. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so he emphasizes a very important point. The integration within the EU has had one consequence that we saw elsewhere, which is we saw a decreasing inequalities between various EU states and Central European have, states have you know, managed to limit some of inequalities compared to the other countries. By contrast, increase inequalities within nation states, both in terms of income, assets, and territorial inequalities. And in a way, one of the characteristics of EU making for a number of nation states in Europe is the fact that you know, historically, the idea of a state and the nation state in Europe is the idea of to integrate, to try to create some form of society. Of course, the French were obsessed by that, and we centralized to do that. But it's an old idea also in North of Europe or South of Europe. So in other words, one of the characteristics of state making is trying to unify, to integrate different groups, to create infrastructure, to give a, a, a unity of the, of the old political project of the nation states. And the argument is that with the rise of a globalized economy and the integration with the EU, this unifying energy has declined quite dramatically. And we've seen a number of countries, a number of protests associated to these rising inequalities. I will not mention our French uh, uh, riots last week or German general strike yesterday or a Swedish big movement a month ago. It's everywhere. Okay, So that's a, a general problem that we, that we see. The argument we made in this book very briefly First, but the, the key dynamics to understand the logic of restructuring in European states was a changing scale. The idea that you have to understand that some social groups are now operating at different scale. I did a book on urban middle classes in Europe, and you see that urban middle classes, they have one foot in their country and one foot where they send the children away, they do a number of things at the EU level or international level. So some social groups, some uh, economic logics, are operating at different 
uh, at different level. And there's a sort of decoupling between the state and, and the nation and the society. And this decoupling between state, society, and economics is starting a number of mechanism transforming. So that was the key point of our book. We also look at uh, the capitalism and the fiscal crisis and what von Streck argument. Um, we look at the transformation of the bureaucracies and the decline of hard politics in Europe until the Ukrainian war. So we have a framework to understand the transformation of European state, Britain being one of them. Uh, but I really want to emphasize the key element for us of restructuring. Um, I'm using the old, I don't know if you're Michael Mann, the British sociologist from UCLA, where this lovely phrase at some point explaining that the welfare state in Europe and the welfare state on cage society. Okay, And when you look at, at the two main mechanisms of the 20th century to create forms of nation state, to a large extent, what we have seen with the making of the EU is the disengaging of society from the nation state. We still have a welfare state, but not for everybody. And the welfare state has played a less important role. So the society is becoming more and more disconnected. And from the point of view of the elite, integrating society is less an issue. And that has a lot of consequence on the transformation of public policy uh, uh, in, a, in a number of, of, of cases. So in a way, the EU, I want to emphasize that the thesis we developed in this book was a very important process of state transformation. And in a way, nation states in Europe became transnational branch of EU regulations. And my colleague Bickerton has done a lovely book explaining that European states were becoming a member state. And the characteristics of a member state is that elite were um, accountable, not just in front of their citizen, but also were, were responsible and had to you know, uh, be legitimate in relation to the elite of the other countries. So by being a member state, you have to do policies both for the EU and the other countries and for your citizen. And that's completely different from the unifying energy of a state, the national conception of a state. So it's sort of post-national conception of a state. And we have seen that in most EU countries. We characterize European states with Desmond King as transnational, and that's just what I mentioned about another state, as capitalist country with very strong interactions uh, with, with, uh, with the economy, as policy state. So remember that EU is still the place in the world with more public policy than anywhere else. I'll give you figures later and are as member states. And the Brit Britain was part of the story. Okay, just one more person. Oh, sorry. Just tell me uh, So the classic view of the state was the Leviathan, remember Ops. So we proposed this conceptualization of a state. I must say it has not been a huge success. I don't know why. <laughs> um, the idea of a, remember, remember Polanyi. Polanyi had a very lovely phrase on the state. He emphasized the crustacean dimension of the state. So states still have a lot of bureaucracy and institutions and rules, and this crustacean dimension is still there. But what is changing is that now states are operating more and more beyond, the, beyond their frontiers and more outside forces are inside. So states have to operate in the global world with a lot of uncertainty, and, but with still a core. And that was the idea. I don't know why, you know it very well, but you know, you have to try that. I have a definition, but I would not emphasize that this time. Right? And in other words, our conclusion was state elite were changing because they were accountable to three types of public in Europe. Their own citizen, the other states, the member state argument I explained before, but also, as Streck has argued, they are uh, accountable to financial interest groups, uh, elite uh, and, and organizations. And the Greek crisis was a good example of what we're discussing. Mm -hmm. So that was our characterization of, of a British state. In many ways, the Brexit was the mobilization of part of the British population and part of the British elite. I'll never forget that uh, a lot of middle-class votes and, and upper-class votes voting for, for, for Brexit, not just working class. It's, that's not true. It's only one part. Um, so we, you know, we had questions. The idea was taking back control to one extent the British elite will be less accountable to other European states, not member states anymore. What will produce for a British state? Uh, should we see a different model of state, sort of global Britain imagined by Brexiters? What are the mechanism of state building or destruction set in motion with Brexit? Uh, does the process risk breaking up, you know, international state? Uh, and what sort of adjustments you can see in parallelations between different groups within the British? That was the, the agenda. 
So number two, uh, what we've seen in this transformation of British state, and we have documented that, and we have a number of points that are not quite, quite clear. I'll meet someone. Yeah. Uh, of course, I will not come back to the old history of the British state. For those who are less familiar, just to remember, it's a, historically, it's a pragmatic state. Remember the history of Hong Kong? It gives you a lot about that. A very industrious, always about economic development. A very liberal in the classic 19th century liberalism, uh, um, John Stuart Mill. Uh, relatively conservative, preserving order, and market-oriented. That's the way the British state has able to change over time. It's a long story. It's in the 7th century, da, 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 the Treaty of Union in 1707. Uh, but just remember about the heritage, and of course, when you look at state's trajectory, you try to think about long-term heritage and institutions. You know? And among the key points, can I emphasize that the British state has always been characterized by elitism, okay? And I come from Oxford, so I know that. Yeah, you know, probably not, uh, that's not changed that much. Uh, it's a very hierarchical state, okay? It kept the monarchy, as you know, but it's more than the monarchy. It's just the social order associated to that, and the aristocracy is still there, and a lot of prestigious rights and strange orders are still playing an important role. Of course, the empire at some point, the Anglican <laughs> church, the army, and the house of lords, and, and there's a very nice uh, phrase that is club governance, that has, I will explain that in a minute, that characterize the state. And what happened since the 1950s, and more importantly, when they joined the EU, is that the UK has become a more multinational European state. So they progressively decentralized to Scotland and Wales, as everybody else in the EU. And I would make the point that this transformation of giving more resources and forms of legitimacy to Scotland and Wales was very strongly connected to the EU. Okay, so it was part of joining the EU was also uh, bringing more resources and, and decentralization. Um, it was less a, a social class and, uh, and still had a, a welfare state. I also want to remind you that in the 1950s, the British state was at a similar corner, meaning there was a real question, what should we do? You know, the 50s was not very good for the British state. And the idea was of course the Commonwealth and they tried to create uh, the Commonwealth as uh, a particular kind where they could really re-emphasize, they, 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 after the first Second World War, of course, they lost uh, a lot of energy and resources to win the war. Um, and, and they tried to do something. They saw the EU in the making and they thought, oh, we don't want that. So they tried to create a political project around the Commonwealth that failed miserably, okay? And the imperial project after the Suez Canal 56 was, was done. Second, they tried to have a very close alliance with the US. So there was a project of, of British elite, we will be the sort of Anglo-Saxon thing. And the States, the Americans said, ah, go away, <laughs> who cares about you? So it didn't work at all. So you have to remember that getting close to the Europe was a solution that Macmillan uh, accepted in the late 50s because everything else had failed, okay? It was not like a choice. It was like, we tried to resist that, but we have no other choice. And of course, when they wanted to join the European project that was already well developed, General de Gaulle said no. Okay? And they had to wait till 72 to be able to do it. You know? But it was, it was like, so it was always, a, we call them awkward partner. They joined the EU late, uh, not with great enthusiasm, neither from the British, neither from the Europeans. And that has been a thing. But I, I, I won't, let's remember. I don't want to emphasize too much the classic things of the British model, mm -hmm. the Westminster model, for those who are interested. Uh, but if some of you are interested, you really must read the best book ever called by Michael Moran. Michael Moran, I was a professor at Manchester. He wrote a book about the regulatory state in the UK, which is fabulous, explaining the characteristics of the governance of the state in the UK and what has changed after Mrs. Thatcher. And one thing he emphasized is this idea of, of club governance, meaning it shows very clearly how historically, when you have a democratization of polity with the vote and, and the universal vote slowly and women and all that, uh, basically the, the British elite always organize in committees, the House of Lords, and they develop mechanism to avoid taking decision under democratic pressure. 
So the story of a British state is to democratize, but then to find mechanism to avoid democratic pressure. Okay, and he calls that club governance. And it's the member of the clubs who are able to collectively define a number of policies. And I think it's a very powerful analysis explaining. And then a lot of things were destroyed by the market make market and the strong state, and this is Thatcher in 79. And then transformed new labor, did a book on new labor. But I don't want you to offer that. So let's concentrate much more on what happened after, after Brexit. The first thing is just to remember that what happened at the time of Brexit is also a consequence of what happened before. And one of the major transformation of the British both state and political economy was the arrival of this coalition in 2010, led by David Cameron uh, after the, 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 the economic crisis. And the economic crisis was a new opportunity for the Conservative Party to lead a very clear project going much further than Mrs. Thatcher. So they really wanted to implement a, a neoliberal agenda. I don't use the word neoliberal easily. I did a criticism of neoliberalism in, in social science, but in the UK case, uh, it's an important part. Can I remind you two things? For me, neoliberal means it's not liberal, okay? And it, it should be differentiated. There are two main differences. The first one is in liberalism, when you have market failure, then you can use the state, okay? It's a classic thing. For neoliberals, that's not the case. When you have market failures, you need more markets. Okay, so that's a very strong difference. The second major difference is that in classic liberalism, you try to, you, know, you don't trust the state too much, okay? You try to protect the liberty of individuals and, and firms. But in the neoliberal framework, you use the strength of the state to force individuals to behave as economic actors. So particularly Friedman and a number of other ones, in many ways, it's an illiberal project, not neoliberal, okay? And they have no problem to use um, the force of the state, including, you know, remember Shelley, in order to strengthen. So uh, the title of Andrew Gamble's book, which is the best book ever on Thatcher, was The Strong State and the Market. You use the strength of a state or a state to destroy the trade unions, the welfare state, whatever you want, in order to force the market logic to organize your country. So that's an important point. So you, you, but you need to destroy part of the old organization in your country to create this market. Uh, so my point is that the political project of the Conservative Party in 2010 with the Liberals Association was really to use the crisis of 2008 as an opportunity to, to force major reforms in, in the system. So they, they started in 2008, 10, sorry, oops, um, a very strong movement of austerity. I mean, in France, we cried about austerity and cuts. What a joke. We never had any cuts at all on, in terms of public spending, okay? We did nothing, nothing. In the UK, it was a massive movement. You saw the figures later as percentage of GDP, uh, the, the cuts when the, the public spending went down with lots of consequences, like the budget of local authorities in poor cities like Manchester, Liverpool, was cut by 50%, half, you know, they stopped libraries, social services, spot ground, food for kids in the, in the schools, everything was stopped. So it has been a massive uh, reshaping state exercise. And that's not explained by Brexit, that was done before. And in many ways, the Brexit vote is explained by that. Okay, that's the other way around, the causality is the other way around. And the Brexit has just accelerated this reshaping of the state in this uh, neoliberal project. And again, a very strict way of neoliberalism, not like a sort of thing. And you could see how the public spending mm -hmm. went down quite, uh, quite specifically, about 25% of, of reduction altogether, with increase on in police, increase on in some domain, and completely cut on housing, on the NHS. So all public services have had 10 to 15 years of cuts, and, and they are today in extremely bad shape for that, for that reason. So what I want to also to emphasize is that, of course, the, 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 the British state had to adapt to the, to the EU, and there was a sort of low-key adaptation and Europeanization of, of a member state of the EU, because you know, in the classic British state doctrine of Westminster is sovereign, 
So Johnny the U is completely contradictory. So some of the uh, more right-wing scholar have emphasized that um, the Johnny the EU was the most important revolution in the UK since Cromwell, okay, since the 16th, 17th century, because it completely undermined the sovereignty of parliament. It's a non-written constitution, but in fact, the EU, they created uh, a Supreme Court in the UK. They reinforce an independent justice system. Remember that not so long ago, the Supreme Court in the UK did not exist, it was the House of Lords. And who was in the House of Lords until Tony Blair? It was mostly the landed aristocracy. So it's still the lords of land still with the Supreme Court in, in the UK. So, you know, it was still medieval in some parts, okay? And all these bits were progressively eradicated by joining the EU. So my point is that the British state as part of the EU, there was a dynamics between decentralization to Scotland, devolution to Scotland and Wales, the strengthening of the justice system and, and the court and a professional justice system and adapting some of the EU regulation agency and EU policy. And the three would reinforce each other. In other words, for instance, when you had conflict between Scotland and, and London, it was, it gave more impetus to the court system to get some independence as to reinforce its role within the British state. When you had conflict between the EU and, and the British government, then the court system was also playing a role to solve the conflict between the two and reinforce its dynamics. And when they, um, the court was with the EU against the British government, Scotland and Wales would support the courts and the EU against the British government. So there was a dynamics of change, which was between Scotland and Wales, the EU and the, and the justice system, with that were completely undermining the classic understanding of the Westminster. And you could see that in a number of islands. So this, this is what happened with, uh, with Brexit. So when Brexit was done, uh, Indeed, as we expected, we started to see a number of restructuring uh, process going on. Uh, and in particular, uh, and I want to emphasize because I'm going to be too long, uh, a very strong uh, restructuring of the state apparatus. So we saw dynamics of centralization, major law. So basically with the Brexit, the idea that EU law should have no say in the UK. So the UK government passed a number of legislation in order to repatriate uh, a number of, of uh, law. Very often they just exactly the same law and they put UK instead of EU. It was not always a major change, but it was an important process. So what we saw, what happened with the revenge of central government, basically they passed new law to undermine the role of the courts and the justice system, to re-centralize, especially with market logic against Scotland and Wales, and to try to uh, develop a different regulation environment for the competitiveness. And then we immediately saw a very strong contradiction because on the one hand, the idea was we're going to destroy all you know, EU regulations, all these bad things that are preventing the competitiveness of a great British economy. Okay, but, and we're going to compete on standards and on norms and on less environmental norms uh, less important standards for, for a number of, of products. But what happened was, if you do that, you're becoming to diverge more and more from the EU. And if you do that, British firms will become less competitive in EU and international markets, because what has happened is that the EU is becoming one of the main regulators worldwide. So a lot of other countries in the world are following EU regulations even in relation to the US. So if you diverge from EU regulations, you become marginalized in the competition on standards and norms. So a lot of firms in the UK have just said, no, 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 we don't want to diverge. Please don't, because we're going to lose our capacity to export, not just in the EU. So instead of regaining capacity to regulate the economy, the, the UK has lost capacity. It is now a rule taker they cannot influence EU standards anymore, but in a way, most of the firms want to still apply EU norms and standards. So instead of being a regulation maker, as they thought, they're becoming a rule taker and they have less influence on the capacity to regulate the economy. And we see that in a number of domains. So less, less capacity. 
The second thing is the idea was you have a regulation shock that would increase the competitiveness of the economy. And of course, it was so naive. Basically, it will take forever. They will spend their life negotiating standards and norms and regulations with the EU and implement the detail and make compromise. It's going to be a lifelong project. They will never get out of it if they're jailed for forever. We saw a lot of incremental change. So progressively, the EU has, has put them away from the Locarno Convention on some of the legal dimension. So there are a number of small detailed things where Britain has been expelled and put aside by, by the EU, and they are losing a number of capacity. The most interesting probably on the restructuring is not just the marginalization of the court system, but also renegotiating trade. And I think that's where the global Britain project was very strong. So of course, to leave the European trade uh, agreement. Um, and as you know, the UK is negotiating very hard to join the Trans-Pacific Trade Bloc. And they are, as we speak, negotiating at the moment to join, and they may join uh, before too long. So they managed to create a trade uh, agreement with Australia, which is very important, about 0.6% of trade, well done. Um, of course, the US has said they were not interested until now. And so they tried to do, so the UK is trying to join the Trans-Pacific Trade, which says a lot about the complete realignment of, of the UK. And I will develop this idea uh, a bit a bit later. And as I said, and I stop there, there's a very strong uh, movement on the three dynamics I mentioned to take away from the EU, to recentralize on UK, on, on Scotland and Wales, and to give less resources and, and, and power to um, the judges and the courts. And we can document that in a, in a number of ways. Okay. So uh, re-emphasizing even the control of central government on parliament. So it's a real massive re-centralization process that has been on, on the way um, uh, with conflict with the courts on a couple of cases uh, with, uh, with the judges. And I should say that. Last point I want to emphasize is the UK state has always advocated, uh, put forward the rule of law. Oh, even Hong Kong mentioned the rule of law all the time. Uh, but, you know, I'm a French social scientist comparative, so I never believe them completely, you know. I live in the UK, so they always say we have a less corrupt country in the world, we have a rule of law, da da da. And when you know the system very well, you just think, mm, you know, it doesn't work so well. But what has been interesting over the last um, decade or so <laughs> is the growing importance of corruption and, and, and lack of transparency on a number of issues. So there are cases after cases where you see that the law has been manipulated by the club governments I mentioned before, some, some of the elites on tax evasion, on uh, public-private procurements, on private-public partnership, on subsidies. So the, the, you know, when you accumulate all the scandal that have been taking place for 10 years, um, and of course, Boris Johnson had something to do with that at some point, but he was not alone, you, you see that this conceptualization of law, the rule of law as a building block of a British state just doesn't work very well in comparative terms. So, um, and, and I, I tend to believe that it is connected also to the rule of the city of London. And uh, you remember that the UK has always prevented anti-corruption drive by OECD and uh, the laundering of money and all these sort of things. The UK has always, because the UK has organized, you know, the Isle of Man is a fiscal paradise. The city of London is a formidable recycling machine of uh, corrupt money as well. And you see the effect of that on the long term. We consider that on housing markets, 9% of the Transparency International Organization identified trust in London, and 9% of um, the upper end of the housing market in London belong to anonymous trusts that were progressively known to belong to corrupt oligarchs from all over the world. Uh, and recycling mafia money from all over the world. So the level of penetration of forms of corruption linked to finance in the city of London within the British state is impressive. Some of the lords are corrupt Russian oligarchs, for instance. So I think it's, it's something which is really transforming one of the pillar of what the British state was about. And COVID crisis was a formidable opportunity for huge corruption, okay? And we will see more of that later. So rule of the law, mm, not sure. Forms of state capture by financial interest 
seems to be more important. And when you look at the finance of the Conservative Party, you understand very much the link between um, the, the financial world and, and the Conservative Party. Okay, third point, briefly, uh, and I will not develop that today, but I'm, you know, we, I make a strong argument on the erosion of the British dimension of a British state and the, the development of the English nationalism. Again, the British dimension was a way to, to an imagination uh, by elite to sort of uh, organize uh, this quite remarkable cohabitation between the Welsh, the Scots, and, um, and, the, and the Northern Ireland uh, as a union, uh, because it's the United Kingdom and uh, of Northern Ireland. So the Conservative Party was, of course, the uh, very strong element. And what happened was, is that this model of a British multinational and multicultural state um, mm. as and, 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 and the more integration within the EU has progressively produced something that nobody saw coming so well, which has been the uh, awakening of the um, English nationalism. Okay, A lot to do against the Scot and against the Welsh. It has to do a lot with the growing importance, but also against the EU. And what we have seen progressively is the making of this nationalist English movement becoming very anti-EU, anti-Judge, anti-Scots, and anti-Welsh. And that has gained, there was a party, UKIP, that has articulated that. Um, and, and they are trying to reinvent this identity. And you have to remember that the British identity was always very anti-Catholic. So part of the, of the uh, uh, campaign, the Brexit campaign was, you know, the European papists should not play a role in the UK, which of course is a bit of an insult for Swedish and, and Northern Germans and, uh, and the North of Europe. But those dimensions, empire, um, uh, religion, were remobilized in the, in the 1990s and, and led the way to, to a very strong form. And uh, I, I like to quote this uh, phrase from Mrs. Thatcher, and I used to love to hate Mrs. Thatcher, and she was such a formidable politician. And she had this lovely phrase once saying, in my lifetime, all our problems have come from mainland Europe and all the solutions have come from the English speaking nations across the world. So the revival of this English nationalism was associated to a sort of cultural myth of the Anglosphere and trying to redevelop possibly the Commonwealth, but of course, African countries say, give me a break. You know, this is post-colonial times. What are you talking about? But, you know, trying to revive the connections with Australia, New Zealand, the US, and to revive what they call the Anglosphere. So it's a very important part of what has happened. I will not develop that here, but it's just something you can, you can um, keep in mind uh, in, 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 in the case. And, one of the dynamics of this that fed this Cameron government in 2010 was at long-term consequences. And what we have seen in the UK is we always had strong inequalities that increased quite dramatically in the last 15 years um, with very strong anti-immigration. So the logic of this English nationalism was also to become anti-migrants and anti-European migrants because European migrants were very important. Remember, London was the real capital of Europe. London was attracting all the young people and lots of people from all over Europe. We don't like to say that in France, we say, no, Paris still is important. Yeah, but London was the real capital of Europe. And a lot of young people were there, lots of new firms. Uh, and it was really becoming um, important. And there was a very strong backlash fed by this English nationalism. Just very quickly, a few figures to, to compare, basically, if you look at poverty rate, uh, basically it is a country where poverty rate has increased quite a lot of the, these figures are over the last 15 years. Um, and poverty rate have increased and they're not close to, to Greece or Italy that have been very, very, Greece and Italy had very, very bad economic crisis. But the UK comparing to Germany or France or Sweden, you know, really the poverty rate has increased. So all the average figures that you see about the UK Remember that the distribution is much more unequal than anywhere else in Europe. So the average figures are less, you know, meaning you have to think about the importance of, of those, uh, of this gap. Income, inequ income inequalities have also increased. And now um, in terms of, of Gini 
inequalities, uh, income inequalities has become very high, and France is also very high. We know that very well. But in the UK has, uh, has, has increased over time. That's uh, the disposable income. So that's after the welfare state redistribution. Um, and the UK is really very close to the US and, and, and Mexico. And our European countries would be far a bit further down. So very strong admit, yeah. <laughs> and the other big inequalities are the territorial inequalities, okay? With the, the, the British economy has concentrated even more on London and the Southeast is our bigger uh, GDP per head, which are you know, fantastic figures, but still. Um, and the gap has just increased dramatically over the last 15 years and is still more today. So the British economy is really the Southeast of England and the rest is, is less and less the case. So very, very strong. And of course, what happened with the UK, with the Brexit, is a change of population, meaning what we have seen is the decline of EU migrants. And so remember the Brexit vote, the idea was the Brexit state will control its population, we want less migrants. But because of the requirement of the economy, what we see is a big rise of migrants altogether, but non-European. Of course, some of them from Hong Kong, as we know. But basically, if you look at the recent figures, you can see that the rise of non-EU migrants has been massive. So in a way, what we see in the UK is still quite a lot of migration, but very strong decline of EU migration, minus 60%, basically, and a very strong migration coming from Southeast Asia in particular, okay? So when you go to the north of England, and I've done some work yeah, around Leeds, and Middlesbrough, and Halifax, all these lovely, lovely towns, um, what you see is that the Polish are gone, or some of them left, but not much, so the Eastern Europe that used to come, there are small numbers left. But what we see is a very big increase of Indian, Pakistani, Southeast Asians altogether. So it's a complete change. So part of this English nationalism was anti-migrants. So it has been successful to prevent European migrants. But by contrast, they have accepted a lot of Southeast qualified migrants. So again, when you think about if one part of the state is to control the population, you see the transformation going on linked to Brexit, a, a serious change of population and, and capital. And my last point, and I finish there, is uh, yeah, also decline of life expectancy in the UK. Okay? And the average figures are something, but in fact, it's increasing for the uh, middle class and upper class. So it's a serious decline, not as much as the US, but it's a serious decline of life expectancy for the half of the population. So that's quite a, a serious. And, and the last point was that the EU and the restructuring and decentralization of the British state is creating new pressure within the multinational states. So as you know, the, the, the Scots have been very mobilized to get a second referendum, and one that they failed narrowly, and they are, okay, it's not very good at the moment with a change of leadership. We'll see what happens. There's a real question whether Scotland will still be there in 10 years or 20 years. And if they still stay in the UK, I would bet it will be with a reinforced federalism and a lot of autonomy. Uh, the Welsh are now becoming asking for a lot of autonomy as well and, and renegotiating. And I think Northern Ireland will go before too long uh, at some point. Uh, so, and I'll finish on that in two minutes. Uh, really emphasize that the promise of a Brexit was also a capacity of the state to create uh, a, a market society and to, to let market logics play a more important role to reinforce the 19th century competitiveness of a country. And that was a very strong rhetoric. We'll be free to trade with whoever we want and the finance of the world will come in London and we'll be a prosperous country again. Okay, so the rhetoric of Brexit was very strong with this idea of regulating the economy. Of course, it's not just Brexit, it's COVID and the economic crisis, but this Brexit dream of, you know, uh, the economic, the glorious economic past, global Britain, uh, the critique of Europe. You have to remember, people forget that when the, the negotiation took place, when the Brexit vote took place in 96, within British press and the media, the view was EU is in decline, EU will explode, it's an it's a, it's a obsolete thing, um, and, and Britain will triumph. Okay, that was the, the general view. Uh, in, in lots of, of the debate, okay? And in a way, that's also one of the reasons of a Brexit vote, is that 
a lot of the population had lost a lot of money and, and, and purchasing power, very low wage over this decade of 2010. And the idea was that the Brexit will bring new prosperity and will raise the uh, standards and the wages of this working class, okay? That was the idea. And uh, someone like Liz Truss, she wrote a book called Britain Unchained with a number of people with the idea that when you unchain the UK from the Europe, then we will be a very prosperous global Britain again, okay? Well, in fact, the economists were right. Sometimes the economists are right, you know, not often, but sometimes. And, uh, and what happens is just the opposite, okay? So very strong decline of household disposable income. Basically, uh, what we see is that the uh, income, uh, the disposable income for, for household is, uh, that's not changed since 2007, uh, and has declined for some group. So the working, the life conditions of part of the population of the UK has deteriorated extremely badly, and that has increased after Brexit, okay? Number one, decrease of standard of living. Uh, second, the UK income are full behind all the competitors. So not only they do badly, a number of countries having some problems, tell you about France, but they are doing worse than anybody else, okay? Thirdly, it's still the only G7 economy where the growth has been so slow that it's still behind the free pandemic size. Okay, so the recovering from the, uh, so all the figures come from Russia times is offset by all that. Um, so you look at cumulative growth, 1922, and you see the UK is behind and it's still the case in the recent um, perspective until 2025, there will be a decade where the UK has a lower growth than anybody else. Okay, thank you, Brexit, among other things. But sterling has depreciated the money, the pound has gone down quite, quite uh, dramatically. Investment is going down. That was uh, the figures, and there's a clear Brexit cut. That was what was planned, and that would be what the EU uh, investment average would go, uh, and that was has happened, uh, actually. And uh, recent, uh, recent change are uh, showing that investment is going down a bit again. So it's not in the, the private sector is not investing anymore. And we saw quite serious discrepancy with the rest of, of, uh, of the EU. Uh, and recent figures are rather showing, showing that the uh, UK business investment does not rebound. So the effect of the UK or the Brexit is a rather uh, sore effect on, on the economy. That could go on uh, on a number. Of course, exports, what did you expect from trade? Uh, Australia does not replace the EU, you know, so uh, that's the figures about exporters and EU importers. So it's both export and imports, but of course, with the new arrangement, they are out of the single market and the uh, export and import fell down dramatically. Uh, even in finance, uh, oh, so here, so I should be careful, but they are losing a little bit. They call them slow puncture, okay? We see something going on. Uh, and in terms of even the stock market, but we see that you, the city is a less appealing place and that the stock market is now less important and not growing as in other countries. So you have a number of, even on the finance that was supposed to be the big winner, it, it doesn't work. Or UK acquisition of foreign companies, UK money, the city of London money was used to buy companies all over the world, it's an old tradition and crisis, and now it's just going down. It's the other one. It's foreign money buying British company, Chinese firms, for instance, doing that. So declining living standards, low productivity, uh, failure of Britain to invest. They created an infrastructure bank that is not working very well. They just don't manage to invest. So it becomes a low investment state, uh, like there's a big project to create a high-speed train. It's very new in the UK. We're going to a high-speed train. No, you know, they try for 20 years, it's not going to work, and it takes 20 more years to get something that will not work very well. So very low capacity. Um, so you could say, well, maybe it's a, it's a time because I finish on that, you know, you, you have to have this curve, but what we see at the moment is that, and that's my conclusion, the project of doing something more like Singapore type um, is not working. 
So because of the COVID crisis and because the economic performance is so low, now they started to investment again. So if you compare central government spending, uh, the UK was the only country that where the percentage of public investment, public spending as part of GDP, okay, a classic measure, public spending as part of GDP. In Europe, it's between 45% and 50% on average. France is the most communist party, communist country in the world. We have 61% of public spending as part of GDP. But the UK went away from the European model. With the transformation of 2010, they went back to 37%. So they lower tax, lower investment. And now because of the crisis, they have to increase expenditure again. So they're back to the European standards. Okay, so my point is about my conclusion. It's uh, we are at a time of complete contradiction in the UK. On the one end, there's one project which is we should be going with a Brexit project. We become global Britain, low tax, low welfare, um, and and the private sector will will flourish and will become uh, a, a prospering country in the world. But it doesn't work. And what we see is that on a number of domains, health, education, infrastructure. The lack of investment is having a very strong impact on the productivity of a country. So the government is trying at the same time to do that. And now they're spending more money and they increase tax in order to repair the sole element in a number of domains. So that's my conclusion. We are, we are still searching for the post-Brexit state. There are some elements clearly that have changed, which I've described. There's some elements that have not worked very well. And there's still this contradiction of whether we want to still be a European type country, a European type state, or whether we want to be a more Asian type of state in, in the sense of, of, of Singapore. And they are in between. And that's where the contradiction is today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for a um, very uh, stimulating uh, discussion about the current state of uh, the UK. Um, so um, we have uh, time for um, discussion for about, uh, I think, uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, so perhaps I could invite um, anybody to, to have any questions. Uh, excellent presentation, Ms. Legal. Uh, there's one thing I think you encapsulated very well was this discussion about the Westminster mentality of certainly recapturing sovereignty. And uh, I'd like, to, maybe you mentioned in your book, but maybe it just didn't have time, which is, well, UK, as you mentioned, tried to regain its reputation, its idea of, let's say, this kind of 19th century reputation. But maybe you also think that uh, during the Brexit, at least from the perspective of how the EU press was treating, they also tried to regain a more infamous reputation towards Europe as well, this kind of, let's say, perfidious Albion as they were before. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, maybe you mentioned this in your book, but... The book is not written yet, so yeah, ah. I can't look at that. <laughs> um, but you are perfectly right in terms of international reputation, uh, both the Brexit and what happened after, uh, as, as it's, it's very difficult to measure. Uh, so that's something that we are always careful, we can analyze the discourses. Uh, but there were a couple of occasions that have played very badly for, for the UK state. Number one, uh, at some point, you know, one of the most difficult uh, file between the EU and, and, and the UK for the negotiation of Brexit treaty was Northern Ireland, and the famous Northern Ireland Protocol. I will not explain everything, but uh, at some point, uh, the UK minister said, uh, we are ready to uh, not respect the treaty and to do unlegal, illegal things in order to push our political point. So the idea that a UK minister at Westminster would say we will not respect the treaty we signed uh, was a devastating blow uh, all over Europe and in the US. So in Europe already, the negotiation gave very bad reputation to the UK, but the idea that you would do illegal thing, you would not respect the treaty you signed for the reputation of a country was an absolute disaster. The second thing that played very badly was uh, dealing with illegal money, okay? So within the OECD, the UK has blocked a number of OECD initiatives to, to make transparency, especially of trust and a number of things. So they resisted, resisted, they're doing it slowly and, and now they are more transparency obliged to do it because there were threat of sanctions. 
but their refusal for a long time to uh, make visible what was in those famous trusts that were located in the Virgin Islands. So thanks to the uh, WikiLeaks and all these things, we've we known a lot about that, uh, as also really a very big blow for the reputation of the UK as a reliable. Uh, so it's not so much Perfect Albion, which is a classic French thing, but it's more an unreliable state uh, that would not respect even the signature of what they do. So that's, I think it's a very important point. That's what I try to, to mention when I, I say the rule of law is becoming less central. There are a number of elements where you see that uh, on the Northern Island, it was incredible. I mean, you know, Johnson signed the treaty and then said, ah, no, he's not, nobody cares about that. We can do whatever we want. You know, there was a, a from Europe, there was the idea that those people were not respecting their word, not the signature of the country's the reputation. Was, was very bad. So he's still surprised by why less people want to invest there, you know, which is a real issue about how reliable they are. So I would associate that to the demise of a court system, to the undermining of a court system, the justice system, and of a number of corruption affairs going on. For me, the three together are, are changing the reputation of the UK as, you know, we have superb lawyers and we are formidable rule of law, and that's the, that's the sort of our law to do good business mm -hmm. all over the world. And there were a number of failures at that point of view. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. And I really enjoyed your presentation and I have two questions for you. I think they're uh, kind of pragmatic questions. The first one is what kind of effect would you think the Brexit have on Hong Kong? I mean, here specifically. And ah. the second question is definitely, so what's the, what do you think is the British government's Attitude towards migration, especially those uh, in the Hong Kong middle class. I don't think all of them enjoy their life in UK, and you definitely different attitudes. For example, you have Singapore. Probably you are welcome to work here for several years, and probably they want you to leave. And also the US, probably you can work there, and then you come. You're going to be a part of them, and probably we can say no to you directly. Yeah. So I'll start with the second question. On the first one. Oh. On the second question. It's a real question mark. So a lot of research is being done because we're not entirely sure what's going on. Um, again, as you rightly emphasize, I want to emphasize that this rise of English nationalism was associated like you know, authoritarian right with parties in many European countries like National Front in France. So it was associated to a very strong anti-immigration discourse. Okay, So part of a Brexit vote is very well explained by uh, anti-immigration, okay? Um, EU immigration was the obvious target because that was a big number. So there were 800,000 Poles, for instance, and there was a more Bulgarian coming in, a Romanian. Uh, so it was a very, it was anti-EU and anti-immigration, especially in the north of the country. That was very strong. So the, the, the Brexit was seen as regaining control, having less immigration. Okay, that was a big discourse. Um, and what is happening, as I mentioned, is that they have developed a quota system, permit system for, for more qualified people to come in, uh, including for Hong Kong people to come in, because the, the economy cannot, cannot survive without that. Okay, it's as simple as that. You know, you have to realize in the health system, they lost between 10 and 50% of all the doctors left and nurses in a system that was already on the margin. So they had to get some other people to come in. Uh, and so, there was the Hong Kong effect, but it was a more general effect. There are some very important now groups of Pakistani origins or Indian origins, so Southeast Asia. And they didn't manage very well, because that's also one of my conclusion. The British state is not a very effective state anymore. The capacity to govern a number of issues and to do public policy is not so strong. Um, they they uh, let, yeah, accepted a lot of, of people to come in. Okay, So that's the government interest and the business interest. But, a number of people in the north of England, for instance, saying, so we have less Europeans and we have more Southeast Asians. They're still foreigners. So the, the anti-immigration feeling is still there. So I have no idea, I'm not a prophet. Social scientists were very bad to, to predict things. But let's say I would not be surprised if in the next five years I would see uh, within the Conservative Party or outside uh, a, a very strong, again, anti-migrant uh, nationalist movement uh, building again, 
you know, I would not be surprised. And then targeted to Southeast Asia. So, uh, because they are more important now. Okay, I would not be surprised. So for the reasons, for those reasons, one should not be surprised. You see a lot of Hong Kong people in Manchester, for instance. Um, and, you know, if you accept the idea I mentioned before that the living conditions of a lot of people in the North of England in particular has deteriorated extremely badly over the last 50 years or so, the arrival of, of these people become, they are qualified, they have some money, so they are buying the flats, they are buying and they are consuming and they are dominant group in some ways because of a, both degrees and spending purchase. Uh, they feel even more marginalized, okay? So I'm not surprised that you see a lot of tension in, in, in the British uh, situation. At the moment, you know, everybody's like, oh, 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 oh. you know, you don't know how things will, will unfold, but I see the pressure building up. So um, it's, uh, on the one hand, people are very welcome, a number of people, and they have access to very good jobs and they can do well, and there are opportunities because the Europeans are gone, okay? On the other end, the way part of the British population is responding, some of it is extremely happy, part of the population is, is not happy, okay? And that's what we see in many European countries anyway. On your first question, uh, it's, I'm, I'm less, you know, I'm not a Hong Kong specialist. What I see is, uh, I see is what happens uh, is, is similar to the, to the EU situation, meaning Hong Kong being part of China, the specificity of Hong Kong is less important. So in a way, you know, at some point, the EU was very keen to get a special arrangement with Hong Kong. Don't, don't care anymore, they, they deal with China, they don't care with Hong Kong, okay? So the, the important part of Hong Kong and, and the way that it represents politically uh, and economically is becoming less important, both for the EU, but also for, for the British state. And in a way, one strategy of the British elite is to try to be at the forefront of international crisis to try to find a role, say, hey, we exist, you know, we're not in the EU, but we're still very important. So we are pushing very hard on, on, on the Ukraine war. Uh, that was Boris Johnson's strategy. And they are very, very strongly anti-China. You know, they are following the US uh, very, very, very closely. So uh, they are treating Hong Kong more and more as part of China and in a rather antagonistic way. And don't remember, don't also remember that they, they see more and more Hong Kong as a, you know, they used to see Hong Kong as complementary to the city of London as a big financial center. Now they see it as a rival, much more, okay? So the attitudes of the UK towards Hong Kong is it's more in competition terms uh, and sometimes antagonistic terms rather than, you know, we, we, that's my understanding, but this is just it's not based on research. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so thanks a lot for the, the these presentations with uh, so many uh, interesting you know, uh, threads that you couldn't develop because of time. Um, I have a, a question about uh, these contradictions that you show in the in the in the state. I mean, one of the ways to do the sociology of the state is to see indeed different groups with antagonistic or diverging interests. You know, negotiating this, this the, the use of you know the administration or the, the existence and creating different ministries and, and agencies and so on. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about you know who these groups are that you see uh, uh, that, uh, for instance, are there groups that got richer even if the economy got smaller that are still gaining from this. Uh, from pushing certain uh, disintegrating strategies. And on the other hand, uh, are there also groups that are really blocking it? And of course, one of my uh, ideas is are there parts of the city, uh, you know, of the financial sector that hope to gain or still hope to gain? And an, a, a kind of uh, opposed maybe group would be the military. What, you know, we see the Ukraine war and the, the evidence that. Uh, by itself, the UK is not a very strong global power, and so what? What is there a, a more um, uh, reintegrating strategy uh, on that side? And 
or you know, what are other uh, contradictions that you may see? Yeah, so it's a very difficult question. So lots of people are trying to understand and to work on that, including because some of those groups are, uh, you know, you, you have to understand that some of the groups that supported the Brexit uh, are now completely disillusioned. Okay, so there's, uh, you know, people were always telling me, oh, you know, people who voted for Brexit, they changed their mind. Until six months ago, seven months ago, there was no change, more or less, in the opinion poll. Okay, it's only in the last six, eight months that people now regret Brexit. Okay, but until now, it didn't change. So it's very recent. So a lot of groups are just not entirely sure, you know, what, what to think. So we know some things. Um, number one, and, and, and you know the work of, of Bonke and, and those people, um, what was interesting in, in the Brexit campaign and then uh, in the Conservative Party. So the Conservative Party is the most important factor in all my story here. Usually I, I say political parties don't play an important role, but in this case, you know, it's absolutely there that, that a lot of uh, dynamics were played for the last, uh, since 2010. Um, as some of our colleagues have shown, part of the finance in, in the UK, particularly shadow banking, uh, pension funds that are less regulated, those who do deals with fiscal paradise. So the more pirate part of, of finance, uh, they, they supported Brexit, and they financed Brexit and the Conservative Party heavily. Okay, so uh, as you know, our colleagues, the idea that there are two types of financial interests opposing each other in the city of London. One group more pro-Europe and trying to be part of the European markets and losing because of the EU, mostly old style classic banking, uh, old institutions, important insurance, the classic legal system. And by contrast, uh, the more recent banking interest and financial interest that have benefited from deregulation and that have played a much more global role um, and far less regulated using all the trust and all the illegal or semi-legal way of dealing with money all over the world. And those people, one, have gained a lot from Brexit because the more disorder, the more they gain from, from have a capacity to gain from uh, the transformational situation. And uh, they are pushing and they are financing uh, these nationalist uh, English nationalism, there are some organizations, the UKIP party that has uh, existed for a while, ups and down, was also financed by some of these millionaires uh, that are even not uh, living in England anymore, living in the Virgin Islands or somewhere like that, or Dubai. Uh, so we see clearly one very strong opposition there. Uh, the, the business elite um, are massively in favor of normalization and being as close as Europe as possible. So in a way, uh, the, the British state elite have been surprised to be in opposition with the business interest systematically. And I think Financial Times reflect that very systematically. So the business interests are always saying, let's get some deal, let's try to renegotiate. And they are very much in favor of, uh, of Now the most interesting thing is what happened to uh, the lower middle class, working class employees, and, and some of the more precarious groups within the UK. And this is a big uncertainty. Uh, it's not at all clear. Uh, clearly, what is very clear for most people now is that taking back control and Brexit has not improved the economic situation. It does make matter worse. Okay, that's, that's one thing which is now largely accepted by a, a part of the population, but they are still very anti-EU, anti-immigration. Anti so nobody knows, in a way, how these groups are, are reorganizing. Uh, what we see is, and you have to remember that the UK has quite an important uh, population from migrant origins, for instance, uh, Pakistanis, India, uh, Bangladeshi now, and Southeast Asia, and those groups are very organized and they are very much in favor of the transformation that I mentioned, okay? Um, and it is no surprise if some of the leading politicians now, you know, say Javesh or a number of, um, or even Prime Minister Sunak, are coming from Southeast Asia. They are part of the Conservative Party and they are really pushing in this direction. Um, and it's not clear uh, what will happen to the youngest generation that was pre-Europe or to this more working class world that is, is very fragmented. For the moment, we don't see very strong recomposition we tend to see that a lot of fragmentation. 
Uh, a lot of people are completely lost. That would be my, my understanding at the moment. Uh, with a strong territorial basis, London uh, and the London Southeast, which is more prosperous, uh, clearly is a, 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 you know, they, they see themselves as part of Europe and, and we are really close to the European model and that's what they, the rest of the country, it's not clear, really not clear. And if, if Northern Ireland goes, and if Scotland has more autonomy, what will happen to England? I'm not entirely sure. So we see some of these economic groups, clearly. Uh, and the last point on the military is interesting because the UK, as every European country, had a very declining budget spending in, in the military. And you know, Michael Mann used to say that the army was the backbone of the state. That was not the case anymore, like in France. You, know, you, know, you only had 70,000 uh, soldiers, professional soldiers in the UK, nothing really. Uh, and because they privatize, they lost capacity. You know, the, the British army is really weak nowadays. The French army is very weak. The British army is still a bit weaker. Uh, so just recently, as part of, of the European war, they are saying we must rebuild, but we must rebuild some capacity, we must rebuild something. But it's it's work in progress. They're just starting to do that. So whether that will be a more important part of a British state, maybe, but you have to spend money. And you have to really, you know, because they privatize so much that most of the technologies coming from the US, there's, there's very little now aerospace industry left in the, in the UK. And now that they lost the connections to the EU, it's even more than that. So they lost subcontracting firms, they lost engineering centers. So the industrial capacity is gone to a large extent. Uh, so it's a real issue what they can do there. But I think it's a very interesting question for the military to come back as a, as a significant part of a British state, which is not today, which is not. But I can't say very much more on that. Okay, um, actually, we have a question from uh, Eddie Tsai. Um, well, somehow you um, answered to some of the part of the question. Yeah. Could you please elaborate on how Brexit and cross class support? Are you as implying that the populist rationale is there? Yeah. Okay. What about the more elite one? Are it just nostalgia for English audiences or more complicated? Thank you. Again, a, a very, a very, very good question. So I'm really relying on the research done by my British colleagues on that. Huh? So uh, particularly Sarah Obold in, in, in London, uh, and Will Jennings and a number of people. So you know, when we look at the vote, what is very clear is uh, a mix of territorial and class variables. Okay. So the more you are in cities, and the more educated you are, the more you voted for Remain, okay? Uh, and, and there was indeed a lot of working class vote uh, against, uh, for Brexit. But uh, what was very clear also is that part of the middle class of the UK voted for Brexit. And they are not those living in cities, that's a rural urban divide. It was not the urban middle class uh, because urban middle class in cities, because they're urban, they voted rather in favor of, of Remain. So in Newcastle, even the north of England, Newcastle, uh, Liverpool, Manchester, uh, they voted in favor of Remain and against Brexit. So what we saw is that a number of middle class, particularly professionals and particularly uh, shopkeepers and, and small business interest, and a lot of them are living in small towns and countryside, uh, in the Midlands, um, in, in, uh, in, the, in the East, uh, in, in, around Norwich and East Anglia, or in the Southwest. Um, so there was a consistent vote for Brexit coming from this upper middle class or middle class defined by economic capital and less by education. Uh, and, and those people, are particularly, and also with an age dimension, okay? So uh, a lot of post um, over 60, 65 voted for Brexit beyond class, okay? And they tend to live less in cities and more in rural areas and small town. Um, so from that point of view, uh, and what is interesting is that this group of people, they did not vote for Brexit on you know, less on anti-migration thing, but much more indeed on uh, this 
sort of they are number one, they are over 60 huh, much more uh, on this nostalgia of the colon. I was surprised. I mean, I've been working on the UK since the late 80s, and I go every month to this country. Uh, and I was surprised to see the reinvention of the myth of, oh, you know, let's go back exactly the same discussion that in the 1950s. Let's try something with the Commonwealth again. Okay. You may remember that after the, the, the Brexit vote, Theresa May, the then prime minister, she went straight to India to say, you know, we should revive all the connections like in the old days of the Commonwealth. And Modi told her, you know, go away. <laughs> Who are you? I just, uh, <laughs> you know, she was like, blah. <laughs> it was like Boris Johnson said, oh, I'm going to India, you know, the Commonwealth, the old days. And uh, the, the trip was postponed. Uh, so, you know, it just, just complete reinvention of a mythic imperial dimension. Uh, and that attracted a lot of, of um, nostalgia from, from an audience. So it's not very old 19th century, it's more 1950s and 60s uh, reviving this model. So that's part of this cross model. And also the anti-immigration uh, sentiment is also widely shared by part of the middle class, particularly those specific group aging and uh, more defined by, by economic capital than, 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 than education. And that's not just in the UK. You see that exactly the same thing. There's a bourgeois vote for the National Front in France, for Rassemblement National. There's a bourgeois vote for Giorgia Meloni in, in Italy. This is not just the UK. It's a, it's a common European thing. So that's, that's where um, I, would, I would say that. So it's a bit more complicated, but it's a mixture of English nationalism and is it nostalgia for a, a type of social order uh, and political order that was... Uh, that was there. My colleagues sometimes add to that uh, a feeling, particularly for it's the age dimension is, is central and cross class, that, you know, the feeling that in the modern world they're not protected by the state anymore. So they get lost because of LGBT movements, uh, because of uh, the race that the debate in all the country. So there's a feeling that the old English social order is has gone, uh, has been dismantled. And, and, and I think the Brexit vote was cross-class from that point of view. So English nationalism, social order, and a bit of nostalgia for the imperial world. Okay, um, any other questions? Um, just to... There's time. I'm, I'm just wondering, did you, do you see any external influence for the Brexit vote? You know, this is a conspiracy theory about, it, it, is that just some social media thing or is that some reality thing? Well, there is a little bit, number one, it's marginal. Okay, it's completely marginal, and uh, you know it was a surprise the result for 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 the elite of the country. You know, sometimes, very rarely in our career, we, we get things right. Uh, I, I my PhD was partly on Coventry in the Midlands, so I've been going to the Midlands ever since from time to time. And a month before the election, I went to the UK, and and my colleagues in London were all saying, "Yeah, no problem, remain." Well, yeah, it was easy. And then I went to the Midlands, and I was absolutely shocked by the Brexit support everywhere. So anyway, so to answer your question, um, I think we should not, maybe there was a bit of that, but it was marginal anyway. Now there is a little bit of evidence that some of the finance uh, for the Brexit camp had different sources. There was a little bit of things on the social media, but you know, the evidence is not massive. We have some evidence of some intervention from, from that point of view. Uh, I've seen you know, there are something, it's very hard to say whether it played a, an important role or not. Clearly it was a small thing, uh, according to, to you know, the big thing that the Brexit vote uh, win because the young people didn't vote. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, big, the big story is the young people didn't vote. Yeah. If they had voted a little bit, there would be no reason. The old people went massively to vote, the young people did not. That's a little bit at the end of the day what happened. <coughs> so not much. Uh, so I'm just exploiting the privilege of Please. being a moderator and um, you have a question about the global Britain that you mentioned. Um, somehow, uh, I think just yesterday, I think there was a report that uh, somehow member states of TPP somehow agreed to allow the UK yeah. to join. Uh, yeah, so apparently um, also this uh, the recent agreement of focus uh, yeah. the UK and the US and Australia about the security issue. So to what extent that this idea of engagement in, in Asia or in the Pacific uh, would be supported and what kind of people uh, somehow really support this idea or what other situation 
and what are the commitments from the UK in, in Asia? Yeah. Um, so two different questions. On on AUKUS, on AUKUS um, uh, that's clearly a way for, I mean, for me, you know, if we come back to the debates of the 1950s, uh, the British elite, particularly from the Conservative Party and a lot in government, so, you know, consistent, important body of a British state, uh, they really want to get very close to the US. Okay, that was the idea of my guy Thatcher a long time ago. And, and they are revived a lot of this Anglosphere idea, as I mentioned, as an alternative project to the EU. So that's a very strong element. Their problem was until now was that the US didn't care. Okay. Uh, so in a way, this, this threat of China and the Ukraine war were opportunities for the British state to really say, we're going to get the forefront with the US and Australia for the China thing, with the US for Ukraine and to really be at the forefront. Okay. So to look for a role, you really, ah, the US needs us at least, at last. So uh, those two elements, Ukrainian the, the war, the Russian war in Ukraine and uh, the, the supposed threat of China have been two opportunities for, the, for what's my reading, for the UK elite to really reaffirm that they are not Europe, Europe and they, that's where their strategic priorities are. Okay, so that's, that's a very strong uh, element. Second, so that's clear. I think for me, that's, that's obvious. Now, the most interesting part is this specific thing and, and their commitment to, to Asia. Really, I'm a bit lost, okay? I still, it's a mystery to me, but I'll tell you what I just, this is not more of a you know, discussion and readings and there's no research there. Um, clearly, uh, part, especially in the Conservative Party, uh, they're trying to, as an, of course, their problem is to find an alternative to the EU, okay, like in the 50s. So Commonwealth, nobody cares, and we had post-colonial times, so it's a bit difficult. Uh, the US is not so interested. Uh, EU, no. So what, what else do you have? So the, the Asia as model, as, as there's two things there, for me, that are linked. Number one is, uh, political and economic model. Uh, it was like, we tried to be Hong Kong or Singapore in a way, and trying to be super competitive, organized around finance, uh, less welfare state, low tax country, uh, becoming a world financial center. And so a number of the British elite, especially the finance people we mentioned before in the Conservative Party, they are attracted by this model. Okay, so uh, when you mention Asia, Asia or Pacific, there's something around that. Okay, trying to go in this direction. How far? I don't know, but there's something about that. Okay, the Singapore upon Thames model, uh, and it's part of the imagination of, of those people. That's clearly something there. The second thing which is connected to that now is is China, and 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 Britain is following China, uh, US extremely strongly, vigorously, in the mobilization uh, against Chinese interest. Uh, also because. Uh, uh, Britain is for sale, and uh, you know we saw Chinese firms so an opportunity, business opportunity, and bought a number of things in Britain. <laughs> of course, they were. Uh, so there's a mix of we don't want to be part of that, and second, I think they they, they mobilized uh, and they see that as part of of Asia is being and uh, feeling threatened by China. They, they, they join this group and they say, we, we, us, we, we are part of it, yes, we want to be part of that. So it's a mix of uh, really political opportunities, uh, very strong revival of, a, of the Anglosphere, and desperately searching for a trade space where we can exchange uh, goods and services and they could export their services and their financial services. So it's a mix of the three. For me, it's a very elite driven movement, plus the support of a growing group within British society. I mentioned before, Southeast Asians, British from Southeast Origin, is a growing, extremely dynamic group within the UK. And they are supporting this move, you know, very strongly so. Now, the rest of the country, I don't know. I don't know. I'm very, very puzzled. Uh, 
the young generations, they, are, they feel much more European in all sorts of ways. The rest of the country becoming uh, part of a Pacific trade, I don't know, it's a mystery to me. Okay, um, so um, thank you very much for a um, really excellent talk. And also thank you very much for um, uh, your uh, questions uh, about the um, state of the UK. So um, please join me in thanking him for uh, this excellent opportunity. And thank you, Chair, and thank you for your invitation.